they're not really alone. Uh, so, you know, uh, that, that poster said, like Facebook, we have a lot of things we have to do. Um, Facebook uh, is also a website, right? Um, Facebook does a lot of things, right? They put a lot, out a lot of open source software. They, they release a number of things. Um, a while back, there was a situation on Android where they had to release a patch for certain versions of Android because their Facebook app would not run otherwise. Uh, and it was a very controversial thing. They were doing things that were a little bit nasty and could cause problems for users. And there was this explanation posted for why. And the guy says, Face oh, I didn't block out his name, sorry. But the guy says, uh, Facebook is one of the most feature-rich apps available for Android, with features like push notifications, newsfeed, and an embedded version of Facebook Messenger all working together in real time. The complexity and volume of code creates technical challenges that few, if any, other Android developers face. I don't know if this dude has ever seen a video game, but like <laughs> anybody from the game industry, even beginner indie game developers, would look at like push notifications, a news feed, and an embedded messenger, and like laugh that off the face of the planet as being difficult to do. Like there's just, however, right, having said this, um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not denying that possibly it is very difficult to do at Facebook within the organization and engineering culture that Facebook has created. So he, he may be partially correct in his statement. But it's many people I know read this and think it's very embarrassing for Facebook. And Facebook has done a number of things just like this. There's a certain, uh, certain something. <laughs> Let's not go too far. Anyway, so there was another blogger uh, who looked at the Facebook iOS application, which is roughly uh, you know, the same application. and. Um, you know, he, someone had noticed, well, this application is very large. It's over 100 megabytes. Why is it so big? It doesn't have that many graphical assets or audio assets or things that you would usually expect to make something big. And they were like, oh, well, the binary is really big. And I wonder why. And so he dug into it. And he found that there's over 18,000 classes in it, right? So you know, it's some kind of Java app where they decided to factor it in an extreme way. And there's 18,000 classes. And then the, the thing that caused this Android problem is that there's a fixed size buffer on Android that holds the address of functions, right? And they made it much bigger than they thought anybody would ever reasonably need, right? <laughs> but if you have 18,000 classes, you're going to overflow that buffer, right? So uh, there, was, there was a whole discussion about this. Um, you know, one guy from Facebook, he wasn't really a spokesperson for Facebook. He was just a random engineer, so I don't want to pick on him too much. But he was just like, he was defending it. He was like, oh, yeah, it's a really sophisticated program, right? Um, Android can, cannot handle the, the intensity of this program, right? It's freaking Facebook. It shows messages from people you barely know, right? It shows bitmaps. Like, it's, it's not hard. And yet, look at how many people Facebook has doing that. In 2015, they had over 12,000. And you can say, well, oh my god, they've got an Android app and an iOS app. And like, what? And they've got their other like paper thing that they built or something. But it's, I mean, how many thousand engineers on each of those things do you actually need in order to build this? Now, again, I've been on Facebook for a while. And you know, their, their motto was like, move fast and break things originally, right? That's, that's sort of uh, what. Uh, they got some good PR out of that for a while, and then they changed it to like move fast. As people got annoyed at how broken Facebook was all the time, they changed it to like move fast and be stable or whatever. But Facebook hasn't moved fast in a long time. It's been basically the same website forever, uh, or forever in computer time is several years, right? I mean, I'm sure that they add a lot of things behind the scenes, like more ways to get people to click on ads and like analytics and stuff. But in terms of the user-facing thing, it's the same old site, except now with really annoying stuff that pops up, like, here's your summary of last year. Remember when you broke up with your girlfriend? <laughs> that was really sad, right? <laughs> you do that. Um, so, that's not cool. Anyway, I'm just trying to get to this. Maybe nobody at Facebook knows how to program either. Um, and maybe that's not that surprising, since they're also a web company. So you might say, like, well, these companies are successful. They make all this money. And my operating thesis would be, um, 
the only reason Twitter doesn't have 12,000 employees is because they can't afford to, because they're not making enough money yet, right? If they were making Facebook levels of money, they absolutely would have a Facebook number of employees with still the same Twitter that you have today, right? There's some kind of black hole that eats the ability to create things. Um, and I don't, so this is shockingly obvious to me and a number of engineers that I hang out with, but I, I feel like I'm standing here saying this and it's a relatively unacknowledged thing in the Bay Area. Like I don't feel like this is commonly understood, that this number is completely absurd. But it is. It's, oh, okay. So, how do you avoid this, right? Like you, you're here at school for computer science, and ostensibly, you actually learn some things. And some of those things are about how to build software well and, efficient, and efficiently, and how to have it be robust and to scale and all this stuff. <clears throat> In other words, you're kind of here to learn the right way to program, right? I mean, I. I knew how to program ostensibly before I came to Berkeley. I programmed in, in basic when I was 10 years old and I sort of learned assembly language and stuff. But I came here and then I really did learn a lot of useful things um, that made me a much better uh, programmer and computer scientist. However, I would not say that when I left this school that I knew the right way to program. Um, I knew better than I did when I entered the school, but one must always be very cautious. So here's the thing is all those people at Twitter and Facebook that maybe don't know how to program that well, or are in an environment that's been constructed that prevents them from programming very well, they probably, most of them went to school and learned a lot of the same stuff. Uh, yet, those companies are seem to not be able to build software. So what's going on? Um, you know, so, so when you learn this, right way to program or aspects of the right way to program, you get a bunch of techniques. And I'm going to go through a bunch of ideas that come out, right? And the thing is, when somebody teaches you an idea, let's say one idea is uh, you should use functional programming, right? Because it minimizes side effects and side effects cause bugs, right? Somebody will be teaching you this. And what they will be teaching you is the benefit of that technique. Because it was, hey, the reason people got designed functional programming in the first place is because they observed problems with other kinds of programs and said, how can we get away from these problems, right? How can we scale uh, to, to run on many, many, many more cores? Well, that's going to be very difficult if, if you, know, you have side effects interacting with each other, so let's get away from that, for example, right? Um, the thing is, every single technique, every single technique, and I'll go into some that are maybe even surprising, uh, has drawbacks. They always, always do. And the thing is, the drawbacks are often subtle, and they're very hard to see. And so when somebody's like sort of selling you a technique in this way of convincing you that it's something that you should do, they're focusing on the benefits. And they're either going to be downplaying the drawbacks, or they'll be ignoring them completely because they're so subtle that they're not something that they talk about. And so uh, what I'm, the reason I'm going to show you all these examples is to sort of reinforce this idea that um, when you leave this school, you probably won't really know how to program either. Uh, you'll have some good ideas, though. You'll have a good starting point, but you won't have the answers. All right. So uh, here's an idea. It's a very general idea, but like, look, um, if you want to program effectively, you should command your computer at a relatively high level, right? You should not get bogged down into implementation details because uh, that's, that's where bugs happen and, and you'll never get anything done, right? So the history of programming languages has been attempts to design higher and higher level programming languages to let you express more in less time, right? That's, that's usually what languages try to do. Uh, but there are problems with that. There are all kinds of problems. And, and this one that I'm going to talk about is just one. And you could say, oh yeah, this other language doesn't have this problem. But it has other problems, right? So you probably can't read this. Probably nobody here can read this. Um, this is a thing that happened, I think, last year. You know, Google also has a lot of employees. But somehow their employees do a little bit more than people at Facebook or Twitter. So I'm not, I'm not going to bag on Google here. Um, They made a browser, right? That's a cool idea. Your web company, make a browser. Um, and they've got a team there that was working on memory profiling for the browser. So you could tell what the browser's doing. 
It's a good idea, right? And what they noticed is in the top box in Chrome, just the place where you type the address bar, when you press a single keystroke, like the letter A, Chrome was doing 25,000 allocations, right? So calls to malloc and free or their equivalent. Now, they were ostensibly on Windows running a faster allocator, so it's not as painful as it might have been, but on mobile platforms they didn't for like various reasons, right? So you might ask, how does that happen? And the way that that happens is you program at a high level and you don't worry about implementation details. And in this case, a very uh, relatively ugly thing happened where there's this thing in C++ called standard string that automatically allocates for you. And if you pass a pointer to, a number, pointer to characters to a standard string, zero terminated pointer characters to standard string, I don't know. How many of you guys program in C++? Does this? All right, so you guys know what I'm talking about, half of you. Anyway, if you do that, it'll allocate, right? But then it'll automatically cast back to care star, so you pass it to a function taking care star, and you do enough levels of that because you have enough layers of glue code between one place and another, and you're just allocating over and over again, and then maybe you do that in a loop, and like it gets crazy, right? So that's a, a large portion of what was going on. There's a few other things that are enumerated. You can easily look this up on the web if you're interested. Um, I don't, when I program in C++, which is pretty often still, I'm trying to get away from it, but it's still pretty often. I don't use anything in standard, because I think it's all, it's all bad. Um, okay, factoring your program and making abstractions. Uh, well, that's a good idea, right? Because abstractions mean you, don't, you can, maybe you did think about the details because you programmed a lower level thing, but then you, know, you want to supply a way for other people to use parts of your program where they don't have to think about the details, or even you two weeks from now don't have to think about the details, right? So there's this technique of like, let's put an insulating layer where the ugly stuff is all down here, and then this layer is nicer, and we talk to the nice part. Well, again, that's one uh, reason why this happened, was because there's a lot of insulating layers, right? Another thing that happens, and I only thought of, I only thought of this this week, or last week, so, uh, or, or this way of expressing this, so I'm, I'm not sure that I'm gonna say it very well, but you know, the goal of abstraction is ostensibly to make your program simpler, Right, because you hide details and stuff. But abstraction actually always only ever makes your program more complicated. That is all that it does. If you are concerned with the program as a whole, which you must be if you're maintaining it or whatever, right? So here maybe I have some low-level code, and then I'm gonna build an abstraction layer for some people to use it in a certain way, and then maybe there's an abstraction on top of that, and one on top of that, right? And then if I come along later, let's say I'm not the author of this code, but I'm coming along and trying to understand it, I don't only have to understand the low-level code, I have to understand all this extra stuff that doesn't even do the job of the real work that the code is doing. It's doing extra things like plumbing or you know how to translate to certain kinds of data structures. Some of that might be interesting functionality, but there's gonna be all kinds of constraints flowing back and forth uh, about when certain routines can be called and under what conditions and what types of values they return and whatever. And you have to understand all of that if you're gonna understand this code base. Now that's not to say that you shouldn't abstract, you actually should, because it makes code usable, right? And if you can't make a good abstraction, that's maybe a sign that the low-level code is kind of garbage and like too complicated, right? You should be able to, but you should try to keep abstractions from being very bulky, right, I think. They should be light, right? So it's a kind of a thing that you want to use in a limited way. And the problem, and I should have said the problem with all of these things, is it's very easy to get dogmatic about techniques and believe that you must use them heavily and all the time and that everyone who doesn't do them is stupid, right? It's not true. All of these things must be used with care and uh, with um, restraint often. Okay, so here's the thing that happens when you abstract a lot. This is from someone's blog where uh, <coughs> someone was making an HTTP request in Java, like through some standard libraries. That I, don't, I don't know which Java framework this is, but it's one of the common ones. This is the call stack, uh, uh, and this is the thing that actually does anything. And all of this is going into that and, yeah, whatever, interfacing, right? This is completely bananas, right? But this is what happens uh, if, if you abstract. I would claim too much. The person who wrote this blog posting didn't actually mind this for some reason. He thought it was fine. So uh, I don't know. But he, he was just interested in how all the modules were interacting. I would look at this and I'd be just like, this is, I'm quitting computers. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. 
Um, I don't want. I certainly don't want to try to come along later and try to understand this. Try to understand everything that's happening all the way through this stack. It's crazy, right? Um, 